Um, okay, so hi everyone, uh, welcome to this session. So we have a couple of, uh, of talks before the, the second coffee break of the day. And uh, so now we have uh, Samson Wang from Imperial College, uh, who's gonna talk about uh, uh, quantum algorithms for linear algebra, so please. Thanks, uh, Yeah, hi, so uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a simple and kind of direct way of preparing uh, quantum algorithms. And this is joint work with Sam Ricardo and Mario Berta. So in one sentence, kind of the broad thrust of what we try and do here is we try and study early Fortran algorithms for classical data. So what do we mean by this? Well, when I say classical data, I'll just refer to, for the purpose of this talk, any kind of data that comes via some classical description. So this can also include, for instance, Hamiltonian problems if we're given this in some kind of classical format. And what about this term, early fault tolerant? Um, now, to motivate this, I'm just going to draw a few kind of very hand wavy pictures, so please bear with me. Um, we can look at some kind of timeline off to the future, right? And on one side of quantum computing applications, we, of course, have near-term um, algorithms. So these are characterized by the limitations um, that we have on current uh, day devices and kind of near future devices. And so in order to exploit this, we kind of try and leverage some classical power, usually, in such algorithms but they tend to lack kind of generic runtime or success guarantees. Although recently some analytic strides have been made as we even heard like this morning. On the other kind of side of the spectrum, we of course have fully full torrent algorithms, which now do have runtime guarantees, um, but often the, the hardware requirements for these algorithms are large. Right? Moreover, there can be caveats which can cl uh, cloud convincing practical advantage for many, many problems that these algorithms are applied to. Right. So in order to bridge this gap, one might ask, you know, can we take these fully fault tolerant algorithms and try and shave down the resource costs, right? And of course, like these algorithms are constantly being refined over the years, but we might really ask, like, if we really want to prioritize this direction, we might even allow some small dip in performance if this really brings down kind of hardware requirements. And so one might kind of try and draw some ideas from both, both regimes, and this kind of motivates a kind of searching for algorithms within this kind of third bubble, which is this kind of early fault tolerant um, regime. Moreover, we'll hope that you know, such algorithms still lie above some classical boundary that loosely crossing this boundary corresponds to hopefully achieving some kind of end-to-end -end practical advantage. So this is what we mean by early fault tolerant, essentially kind of hardware efficient. And for this work, um, we'll really focus on trying to reduce the total qubit count. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, uh, I'll first kind of outline a kind of typical fault tolerant quantum algorithm for linear systems and quickly discuss kind of other early fault tolerant approaches out there. And then we'll discuss our approach and then finally look at a ex concrete example for the linear systems problem again. So we can, let's begin. Um, so a typical modern quantum algorithm for classical data might look something like this, right? So at the core, of course, we have a quantum circuit and we might have some classical pre-processing or post-processing. Uh, and moreover, there'll be a, an additional element in the algorithm very often, which is this kind of quantum data access model, right? So we're operating on classical data, and very often in, in such algorithms, we ask for kind of coherent access to this data, and this will be provided by this quantum data access model. So to see concretely how this kind of looks, uh, we can look at the linear systems problem. And so classically, the kind of problem we might want to solve is we have some matrix A and some vector B, and we want to invert A and apply it to B, right? Now, quantumly, um, a modern approach to solving the so-called quantum linear systems problem might look something like this, right? So given a block encoding of A and some oracle access to a quantum state ket B, find the quantum state ket in A inverse B, right? And now already visually, we can see these are kind of two quite different problems, right? Um, nevertheless, we can look at the complexities for the quantum problem, right? And we'll see that this depends on some number kappa, which is the condition number of the matrix, and it has some logarithmic dependence on the inverse approximation error, epsilon. And the, the algorithm will only use order log n qubits, where capital N is the length of the classical vector B, right? And this seems promising because, obviously, the, the, the vector is length n, right? And we're only using order log n algorithmic, algorithmic qubits. And also, um, in the runtime, there's no rank dependence, which you'll actually get with classical solvers. Right. However, as we can already kind of visually see, like there can potentially be many caveats. Right. So here, we're returning a quantum state, and the classical algorithm will tend to return you a full, 
full vector. So if we want to do tomography, we incur dimension dependence in the overhead. Uh, we've assumed that the classical vector B is provided to us somehow as a, as a quantum state. There's kind of normalizations everywhere, right? So for instance, we've assumed that our, the, at the end of the algorithm, we get out a quantum state, and this has some implicit normalization. And moreover, there's a, um, this data access model we need to deal with, which in this case is a so-called block encoding. So a block encoding is kind of one kind of modern approach of um, providing kind of quantum access to, to classical data. And here we're simply embedding um, a classical matrix, uh, um, an arbitrary matrix A in some larger unit tree. And it turns out um, for generic A, if we want to, for instance, implement this block encoding using a QRAM, this can use up to kind of order n squared qubits if we only want order log n gate depth each time we call this block encoding. Right. And there are kind of further refinements you can make, but you'll, you'll always seem to use at least kind of order n qubits. And this somehow now seems quite scary because before we were only talking about using log n qubits, right? But then in order to provide this data access, we're potentially requiring up to order n qubits. That said, um, as a kind of heavy asterisk, right, if the matrix A has some structure, we can often exploit this, right? So for instance, as one example, if A is given as a sum of L unit trees and L is relatively manageable, like it's quite small, then we can use, for instance, so-called select and prepare oracles to get away with only using log L qubits, right? And this will incur an extra kind of order L in the gate depth. Nevertheless, this is still a kind of additional resource we might want to reduce, in, especially in a kind of early fault tolerance setting. Right. And now uh, briefly to discuss kind of other early fault tolerance approaches. Um, these have mostly been in the realm of kind of Hamiltonian problems, so ground state energy estimation, ground state preparation, and so on. And they've mostly all followed a similar spirit, which is to try and trade circuit depth for increased number of circuit samples, right? So reduce the kind of coherent quantum depth you're running and just run more quantum circuits. And these mostly have all followed by measuring complexity in terms of another quantum oracle, which is a kind of Hamiltonian time evolution primitive. And this is a very nice idea because, I mean, Hamiltonian time evolution itself is a widely studied primitive, right? But we can kind of categorize them into two kind of broad approaches. So the first kind of set of approaches uh, are very kind of query efficient, but they will require more qubits. And then the second set of approaches, such as Trotter-based approaches or Q-drift kind of randomized approaches, don't use any more qubits, but incur quite heavy uh, epsilon dependence in gate depth, at least in kind of worst case uh, runtime guarantees. Right? So we might also ask for something that's somewhere in between these two regimes. Right? So we don't want to use any more qubits, but we also don't want to incur such heavy error dependence in the gate depth. So now we can go on to our approach. And the first idea will be similar to other early fault tolerant approaches to, to kind of use the power of running many quantum circuits. Right? And we'll restrict the size of each of these quantum circuits to only be order log n's. And then the second idea will be we'll try and remove this quantum access to the data and replace it with classical access. Right? So in doing so, we kind of remove all the kind of extra resource requirements of asking for this quantum access. And how can we do this? Well, so we have an intuition to try and look for matrices with some structure motivated by physical systems. Right? So here we kind of focus on matrices with a known Pauli matrix decomposition. Right? So here classical access will just correspond to, to knowing the coefficients of this de decomposition and their weight, which is the L1 norm of these coefficients. Um, and the kind of problem we'll shoot for is, is to kind of look at the class of problems where we have some matrix, we have some function, and we just want to sample properties of, of this function. Right? And the way we'll try and tackle this is we'll use some previous ideas of, of there's an interesting way of decomposing um, kind of these time evolution operators into a linear combination of strings of Pauli gates and Pauli rotations. And this decomposition um, has this interesting property that we can actually increase the number of Pauli gates and Pauli rotations and uh, trade and reduce the kind of weight of the linear combination, which would be the kind of size of the coefficients. And this is a linear combination, so it's equivalent to a probabilistic combination up to kind of phases and reweighting. And so the idea will be quite simple. We will just look for functions with well-behaved Fourier series approximations, and then we'll sample from this big kind of linear combination or probabilistic combination, 
and randomly compile everything in one step using kind of previously studied circuit primitives. So more concretely, the, the two types of problems we'll be able to, to look at are as follows. So we can prepare the effect of F of A, and in, in the first case, look at this kind of state overlap property. And otherwise, if we, can, if we have ability to measure some observable O, we can look at more general observables. Right. And so the main result or the claim will be as follows. Um, so if we're given a Fourier approximation to F and the Pauli decomposition of the matrix A, then we can write down a sampling algorithm which will give us kind of these two quantities, as long as we can, of course, prepare like these, these states, phi and psi and, and rho and so on. And moreover, this recipe will tell us you know, the maximum number of quantum gates and also the a sufficient number of, of circuits we need to run in order to hit some approximation error, epsilon. Right. And what will these quantum circuits look like? They'll simply just be uh, the Hadamard test circuit or its kind of cousin. And in this Hadamard test circuit, we'll just run controlled uh, gates where these gates will be Pauli gates and Pauli rotations. Um, so the algorithm will look something like this, right? So we'll have a subroutine that repeats many times, and each time we'll sample one string of gates from a given probability distribution, which again will be Pauli gates and Pauli rotations. We'll run this Hadamard test circuit, obtain a single measurement statistic, do some cross-processing, and then average many times, and then we get an answer that looks kind of like what we want. Likewise, for more general observables, we now just sample two strings of gates independently, run a kind of similar circuit now with the first set of gates controlled, the second set anti-controlled, and again, everything else follows similarly to before. So we can look at a concrete example now for linear systems. Um, so now for linear systems, we'll see that uh, our approach kind of gives, solves, again, a almost third type of problem. It's not quite the classical problem it's not quite the, the traditional uh, quantum linear so system solver problem. Um, so we'll be able to prepare, again, this overlap quantity and measure kind of general observable. And we'll see here the function of interest is, of course, the inverse function. Right? The qubit count will just be logarithmic plus constant. And we can write down the complexity for the, the number of circuits we need and the maximum number of um, non-Clifford gates, which would essentially transform transfer into the uh, maximum gate depth, right? And we'll see again, we have dependence on uh, this condition number kappa, as well as um, a dependence on the Pauli weight lambda in the gate depth. Right. Now, so how does this compare, for instance, to state-of-the-art modern quantum linear system solvers? Well, it really depends on kind of what problem we're exactly looking at. So we can kind of pick one example so one, in, one problem which might be interesting for, for quantum algorithms to, to solve are evaluating uh, Green's functions in many-body physics, right? So this kind of describes the response of a system of kind of injecting and then later kind of removing a, a particle, right? And if we, if we stare kind of closely at this, we'll see that this problem essentially amounts to a kind of matrix inversion plus a kind of uh, ground state property estimation looking at the overlap with a ground state E0. And so we can at least ask, like, okay, for a type of problem that looks something like this, a kind of over state overlap quantity that we wanted to prepare, kind of how do the complexities compare? So on the left-hand side, we can write the complexities for our problem. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we can start filling in complexities for, for state of the art. And we'll see, like, again, like, there's many, like, problem-dependent uh, specific things we need to fill in. Right, so um, for state of the art, we have a kind of block encoding overhead which goes both into the qubit count and also multiplies into the gate depth, right? One example, for instance, if we're being kind to state of the art and like look at um, a system where the number of Pauli terms is small, then we can again use these select and prepare oracles. And so we have order log L um, additional qubits required and kind of order L uh, going into the gate depth, which then can be compared with the Pauli weight lambda, right? Um, in addition, on the right-hand side, we're preparing a quantum state, right? So we also need to, at the end of the day, extract a number out of this. So we can either then incur a 1 over epsilon squared uh, complexity with incoherent sampling or a kind of 1 over epsilon gate depth with amplitude amplification type approaches. And you'll notice I, I drew kind of different epsilons on, on the left and the right, right? Because on the, on the right-hand side, we, 
additionally need to take care of the normalization, right? For many problems, we might not actually want this normalization and even have to find it, right? So, oh. so again, we need to take into account the resources to find this normalization. And uh, finally, um, a kind of nice feature of our approach is that um, given for some problems, given some sparse classical access to the classical vector, um, we can actually compile the effect of this kind of non-normalized state, uh, ket b, uh, by paying some extra classical steps and some extra sample overhead, but no kind of additional gate overhead. So the kind of takeaways of this complexity comparison, I'd, I'd say first of all was that was quite messy and complicated. Um, and so like it's really, at the end of the day, these comparisons I think really come down to a really like problem specific um, situation. Um, but generally we find that, okay, we have a lower qubit count. So we're really only using kind of log n plus at most two qubits. And generically we have a kind of up to quadratic extra overhead and gate depth with some savings if the Pauli weight is small compared to, for instance, the number of Pauli terms. Right? And in, addi in addition, we're paying some extra sample overhead uh, by some factor, which again, depending on the problem, can be very large or can be kind of as small as one. Right? Um, we can also look at other functions, which I won't have time to, to look at, but it's an interesting question of you know, what other functions are kind of amenable to this approach. Um, one, t one type of function we could look at are Gaussian functions or exponential functions, which can lead to algorithms for ground states and Gibbs states. Um, and I'll just end briefly on a quick comment, which is that essentially what I've uh, shown you today is kind of a very, very specific way of decomposing some function of interest, f of a, into essentially a, a linear combination of unit trees, right? And our algorithm is very simple. What it does is because these unit trees are reasonably implementable, we will just sample from these coefficients and apply these unit trees, right? So this is just one very specific way of, of choosing such a decomposition. And this will enable us to evaluate quantities like we have on the right-hand side. Right? So one could ask, you know, like, can we do better with, uh, in sample complexity by finding other kind of linear combinations of unit trees, right? And the answer, uh, the kind of, and wavy answer is you would not really expect to do so much better, at least with like basic standard Monte Carlo sampling, right? And the reason why is that the weight of this linear combination is actually lower bounded by the operator norm of f of a. And um, what we'll find in, if we look back at the linear systems problem is that we essentially achieve this up to logarithmic factors. Um, now, so to summarize, um, I've just shown you a kind of a simple class of randomized algorithms for sampling from functions of matrices, right? And so we can give a recipe to construct such an algorithm whenever we have a Fourier series approximation of some function of interest and a Pauli decomposition of a matrix we care about, right? Um, these could kind of, the main, the main appeal is it's a kind of got a low qubit usage, right? And potentially comparable gate depth for certain problems. Uh, and moreover, there are different properties to state-of-the-art algorithms. For instance, um, it can be natural to compile a kind of classical vector and kind of remove this oracle access to kind of uh, quantum encoding of classical vectors. In terms of future questions, I think one, one important question is if we're not looking at, for instance, Hamiltonian problems, like how do we obtain this kind of Pauli input model for different classes of matrices? Um, and I think in this com complexity comparison, we saw like Things can get really complicated, but also the complexities can, can really change depending on exactly what problem we're looking at, right? So I think in general, it could be useful for us to kind of do more fine-tune end-to-end resource analysis for different quantum algorithms. Uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude and if I can go in the right direction. And yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, so we have time for questions. Uh, yes. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm trying to understand the difference between the two quantum versions of the linear system solving that you're mm -hmm. defining. Yeah. Um, am I understanding correctly that you lose kind of the ability to sample from this quantum state that is the result of the linear system solving? Or like if you weren't interested in expectation values but just sampling, like measuring in the computational basis and, and getting a sample in the computational basis according to this quantum state from the Born rule, 
would you actually lose it in your algorithm or would you sorry I, I, I think I understood the first part but what was the second part what are we losing uh, yeah oh. so if you take that state that is yeah. uh, yeah, m minus 1b um, like in the normal state of the art algorithms you can just measure it in the computational basis and you will obtain something that is distributed according to the Born rule would you lose that ability with your algorithm yeah so our, our algorithm never spits out a, a true quantum state right so we're getting out like classical numbers yeah, but these quantum, yeah, these classical numbers, they will not be distributed as the, for instance, the bit strings when I measure that quantum state in the... No, not, the unless, un, not unless you, I mean, you, if you chose f uh, psi to be the, the computational basis states, then, then yes. Yeah, you then you can this. estimate the probability, right? If you choose yeah. psi to be that uh, computational basis state, you can estimate the probability. Yeah, so but you, you, you cannot sample from that probability, like uh, using a modification of your algorithm. Uh, I think you could you could sample from it if you included if you included a, a kind of subroutine within the randomized Afterwards. protocol to first yeah. sample a computational basis element and then and then run the okay. algorithm. I think you could inc include this together. Okay. Um, but certainly, yes, yeah, you need to decide what property you're kind of measuring I see. before you start. Okay. Um, but one might argue also in in, in most problems with with uh, quantum algorithms on classical data, you, at the end you, you want a number, right? You don't want actually want a, a quantum I mean, state. like, if yeah. you look at recommendation systems, for instance, you know, this Prakash uh, Kennedy's, what they care for is a quantum state like this, which it, afterwards they measure in the computational basis, and this will return the recommendation, right? So you, that this is one way of avoiding the output problem, right, in, in, your, in these mm -hmm. types of algorithms. And it will be interesting if your algorithm could also return such samples as well. Yeah, no, that's you really interesting, I mean? yeah. Uh, I had we not looked at that explicitly, okay. but I would suspect that you could you could incorporate this. Yeah, I don't see why not. So. Yeah, scheme. that's why I was, thanks. No, thanks for pointing that out, yeah. Thank you very much, Samson, super nice talk as usual. The, in the other thing, when you were showing these epsilon prime primes, mm -hmm. and you were, so can you show them again? Oh, yes. Uh, so you mean so what, what this part? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, if you, like connected to what he was saying, yeah. if you really want to, if you use the standard QSVT algorithm and you really want to prepare the state that encodes the solution, mm -hmm. uh, you would need these renormalizations, right? Because right, you do the block encodings would, and... The, your answer would have that exactly. uh, extra denominator in there. Right. But if you use the standard QSVT just for estimating the properties that you sample here, right? Then that normalization is not required anymore, no? Or, or, so or what kind of property do you want to estimate with? So the, the, the requirement on renormalizing this epsilon prime yep. comes from the requirement that you control the, the, the total trace distance of your final output state mm -hmm. because you're interested in that state. But if you're only interested in the expectation values of observables up to additive error epsilon, then I wonder, uh, I'm trying to understand if that's the case. If I would also need, it, you know, if I use the standard QSVT algorithm and I'm only interested to additive precision estimation of expectation values, I wonder whether you also need to renormalize the error there. Right, yeah, I, but I, I, I'm just asking, I'm, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it depends on exactly what problem you're looking at and what, what property you, you're wanting to, to sample, right? Like, um, again, if you if you actually wanted, like, the, what you're reading at the end is some classical vector and you want to find some computational basis element and you really care about the magnitude of this element, then, then yeah, you need to find the normalization. But there could be other... Uh, there could be other problems where you actually don't need this normalization and you just need the proportional, um, the pro proportion, you don't really need this kind of proportionality factor and then it's advantageous for kind of the traditional yeah. approach. Thanks. Yeah.